lift our hands all over this room. And come on, the main attender tonight, the one who we're building a throne for, he has a name that is above every name. And at this name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So let's just lift up a shout of praise to Jesus. One, two, three, lift it up. Come on. Hey, straight to Jesus, straight to the Father, straight to Jesus, straight to the Father. You alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. You alone are worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb, hey, till I met you. Hey. I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures, I tried so hard to hide. It was my tomb, till I met you. Oh, you call my name. Let me hear you. And I ran out of that grave. Hey. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. Yeah. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Yeah. And now your freedom is all, is all I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name. Everyone in that prayer, out of that prayer, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that prayer. Glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of hell. When I'm broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have the future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name. to the light. Come on. We're coming out of the dark and into the light. 
said 911 pray you know Pete's having a seizure so what we found out was a massive aneurysm he shattered both of his shoulders he shook so bad from this and how many of you I know that some of you guys are maybe even in the position right now that you need a word from God it doesn't matter you know you need to hear what God has to say about the situation that you're facing we need a word from God in America we need a word from God in our families. We need a word from God in our situations, in our circumstances. What is God saying? So we were driving my sister-in-law up to the hospital to see my brother. And we pulled off into this church, and it was closed for the week because it was during the week. So it was an empty parking lot, and all these cars were going back and forth. And I said, Lord, I've seen you do so many miracles. But I need you to do one now for my brother. And since my area of faith is I sing a lot. And honestly, I needed a miracle at that moment. I didn't care who was on my right or who was on my left. I got out of the car, and in this empty parking lot, I just started running up and down saying, You are good, and your mercy endures forever. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. You are good, and your mercy endures forever. And I'm here to tell you today that my brother is fully whole, fully well, no problems and complications. Can we just lift up our voices and celebrate the one who is worthy? And I get it. It wasn't me just singing, but what I found out is that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living on the inside of a generation. And that's what empowers our praise to move mountains. I've got to praise that and we'll break up heavy chains. I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their grave. I gotta let it out. Come on, sing it out. I've got a praise that will break off heavy chains. I've got a song that makes hell begin 
to you, God, and I know we're singing this a lot, but I believe there is a shift coming to the sound in America and the American church. We're not just here, and I know you know this, we're not just here to sing some pretty songs tonight. We are here to get the heart of heaven and see the will of the Father released in the Southeast. So one more time, we're going to sing this out, and we're believing there is a sound that is going to go across this nation, and it is going to cause demons to tremble and the kingdom of God to be established. Heavy chains, I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their Come on. I gotta let it out. I gotta let it out. I've got a praise that will break off heavy chains. I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their grave. I gotta let it out. I gotta come on one more time. I've got a praise that will break off heavy chains. I've got a song that makes hell begin to shake. I've got a shout that brings dead men from their grave. I gotta let it out. Gotta let it one more time. We've gotta let it hell tonight, tonight. All over this place. Oh, we've gotta let it out. Come on. Mountains are moving, strongholds are breaking. Mountains are moving, strongholds are breaking. Come on, mountains are moving, strongholds are breaking. Mountains are moving, strongholds are breaking. Mountains are moving, strongholds are breaking. Come on, can you just lift your hands all over this room right now? God, do you see the generations coming together? And you see our hunger and our desperation for you tonight. And we just decree that the Southeast belongs to Jesus. Come on. We decree that the Southeast belongs to the King of Kings. And we decree that the Southeast cancer cannot stay. We decree disease has to bow its knee to the name that is above every name. Come on, just begin to lift up. We're going to war for just a little while. Oh. That's it. Keep lifting up your voices. Just 30 seconds. Let's just press into this right now. Come on, healing is happening right now. Healing is happening right now. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. Come on. This is a house of healing our hearts are full of faith you have our full attention yeah you have the final say so we say come alive in the name of jesus come alive in the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. Hey. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Hey. So we say, there's a resurrection. Your blood runs through our veins. Your kingdom triumphs over even the 
to meth and got his girlfriend pregnant. How many of you are praying mamas in the room and praying daddies in the room? I'm just here to tell you and give you a shot of hope tonight that God is listening to the sound of your voice. God is listening to your prayers. So 
my brother getting his girlfriend pregnant was his wake-up call. He turned back to God. She got right with God. They got married. Now he's been drug-free for years, alcohol-free for years, and they have five children. Listen, I understand what the doctor told you. I understand what your children are saying and what they're doing, but there is a God who still moves mountains. There is a God who still heals. There is a God who delivers. So can we, by faith, just begin to sing this out? I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me. Come on, sing that again. I've seen. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me. Come on, sing that again. I've seen families reunited. You tell me, oh, one more time, say, I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me. So we say, we say, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name. This is. We bring everything to the feet, everything. This is, come on, just begin to lift up your voices all over this room tonight. Come on, we're just contending right now. Families are gonna be reunited. Loved ones are turning back to Jesus. Come on, families are being reunited. Come on, come on. I just hear the Lord saying, in Jesus' name, we break off a spirit of divorce over this region. In Jesus' name, we break off a spirit of divorce over this region. Come on, this is not to discourage anybody who has gone through that path, but we decree and declare healthy marriages. Come on, we decree and we declare whatever station of life you're in, we decree healthy marriages in Jesus' name. Come on, that's something to shout about. That's something to contend for. We decree healthy marriages. We decree healthy marriages in Jesus' name. This is a house of miracles. Because we bring, we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come on, sing. We come up. We say, Come a lot in the name of Jesus. Come a lot. This is a house of miracles. We bring, we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything. This is a house of miracles. Before we go on, I just, I feel such faith in the room tonight. I think we need to sing, sing, I am a house of miracles. And this is a thing, it's not just you, but it's Jesus in you. Jesus in us. So let's sing this chorus out, but let's say, I am a house of miracles. We say, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive. In the name I am, I am a house of miracles. We bring everything to the everything I am. I am a house of miracles.
a theory that noise in church turns the sinner off and they won't get saved but I'm going to tell you that sacred cow I killed that sacred cow I'm going to tell you why I love to kill sacred cows because they make the most delicious hamburgers I want you to know that when you give God the glory it removes the lost soul's protection against God. So I wonder if you would understand that I, I checked it out and last night uh, the devil had to go into the concussion tent. They're checking him out right now to see if how many of you would like to put him out of business. So clap your hands all ye people. Shout I want every individual to listen to the ground rules. The laws of science stopped when you walked into this tent. The laws of medical science were overruled. The Word of God is the supreme description of everything in this proceeding. Every life, every need, every hurt, every depression, every addiction, every sickness, every single work of the devil is going to be destroyed under this tent because we are having a personal appearance of Jesus of Nazareth. He is here. Shout like you know he is here. He is here. This is a shout being heard around the world right now. How many of you are ready? How many of you are ready for the best night you've ever had? Well, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. 
Once again, Catherine and her team have been amazing. And, and we need to thank them one more time. Well, she, she was amazing. Just amazing. I wonder if you'd be seated right now. And I'm gonna release everyone on stage to go and uh, find their seat. Now, here is what you need to understand. It is Tuesday night. Out of the four nights, the night people take off because certain religious people claim they need rest, This would be the night that you wouldn't be here. But we are on the verge of having the biggest night of all the, the nights right now. You can look around and every seat is gone and folks are still coming in. And that is an amazing indicator. And I have one word for it, yikes. Because when the army of God wakes up, it is an astonishing thing. It really is an astonishing thing. Tonight I'm going to do something that will make you famous. You're going to be famous. Because there is a before and after. And I want you to look me in the eye because I've never been more emotional about something as I am right now. Those of you that are our guests, who have the most beautiful look on your face, my favorite look, the I was kidnapped and dragged here by my friend look, <laughs> I want you to relax for a moment because I'm gonna do something shocking and unusual. I'm going to receive an offering. How many of you glad I'm gonna receive an offering? Boy, look at that, well, they're clapping over that. I'm going to tell you a story of this offering because I don't know of anything that is most ignorant in the modern church than giving. We have polluted it, we have distorted it, and there are two kinds of offerings that I cannot stand. The first is the 45-minute begging. I don't know of anything more abusive and cringy. The 45-minute offering feels like fingernails on a blackboard. I have other analogies, but I'll save you the pain. The other offering that I don't like, look me in the eye, is when they're ashamed to ask. And they clear their throat and they act like talking about money is evil or wrong. To which I say, if you don't believe in what you're receiving the offering for, why are you doing it at all? If you don't believe in what you're doing. America is in grave danger. America is in such danger that Jesus visited me to talk to me about my age and my future. I want you to know that I have been under a very special mandate from God to increase the number of crusades I'm doing in the United States. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. We have a unique gift because something has happened to Mario Murillo Ministries that is very rare for any ministry and I want you to listen to what it is. We no longer wait on an invitation to go to a city. We literally are at the place where any place in America that has a need, we don't wait on the churches to unify. We don't wait on a letter from a committee. We can choose a city in the spirit and go to that city and put on a citywide crusade right now. You know what? 
We can go to New York City right now. I'm going to say it again, because I want you to get in the, we can go to New York City right now. We can go to Chicago right now. And I'm going to prophesy something that many of you aren't going to be ready for. I was born and raised in the city of San Francisco. I know that devil. And one day, I'm going to approach a very wealthy individual, and I'm going to say, give me one million dollars to do a crusade in downtown San Francisco. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that again. I'm going to ask for one million dollars to do a crusade in downtown San Francisco. And I'm going to tell you, God will flip that city upside down. He will heal cancer. He will heal paralysis. He will heal the AIDS virus in the name of Jesus. In the, during the Second World War, the armed forces of the United States raised what they call war bonds. Tonight I'm announcing the national war chest to save the United States of America. We're going to build the national war chest so that we are able to go to a city whenever we want and we need a bigger tent than even the biggest one we own now. I believe that we are on the verge of watching millions of Americans repent and get saved. Now, we're also going to raise up other crusade evangelists. I want to tell you, I'm a troublemaker. Look at me. I'm a troublemaker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kidnap some of these young preachers and get them delivered from their lackadaisical wokeness and their, limp, their limp-wristed, watered-down gospel. And I'm going to turn them into fire-breathing, devil-busting, signs and wonders evangelists. I'm going I'm to raise them up in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, Patton was uh, the general in the Second World War that Hitler feared. He's the only one he feared. General George S. Patton. Many of you know who I'm talking about. But I'm going to tell you about General Patton. He was not invited to Germany. And I can't stand these young preachers that say, I'm waiting on an invitation. Let me tell you, when the devil began to kidnap and rape and do mayhem in our cities, you were invited. Because when the devil said, I'm going to disfigure your children, I'm going to destroy your economy, I'm going to turn you into a bunch of perverts of people, that's when the army of God should have recognized it. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. i got to hurry. It was 3 o'clock in the morning when God woke me up. Help me. What is up with God and 3 o'clock in the morning? How many of you have a, you know, they talk about a bucket list. How many of you have a list of questions you're going to ask when you walk into heaven? I'm very alert at noon. How many of you are alert at noon? But no, he's got to wake you up at 3 o'clock to talk to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I was appointed by the Lord to study the youth culture. Because in every instance, in every city, our audiences have been getting younger. And they're getting younger all the time. And now we've done a preemptive strike by having a children's crusade right next to the tent. So we're not going to wait. But I remember when the Lord said to study the youth culture, and I did it day after day after day after day. 
And one day in the middle of my study, the room that I was seated in studying turned dark and I felt evil enter the room. I could tell it was the enemy. The very atmosphere I was in turned into dread and, and vileness. And I could hear this threat. I'm going to take your children and pervert them. I'm going to blind them. I'm going to twist them up in a knot and get them to kill themselves. I'm going to disfigure your youth generation. And it got so intense and I felt writhing in the evil when all of a sudden the room lit up and the voice of God said, but I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters and they will prophesy. Now let me ask you something. If you own this tent and everywhere you went it was full, every night that you preached you'd see vast numbers of people getting saved. And then you look at America, the condition it's in, and we are far closer to destruction than any of you know. We have opened our borders. We've got terrorists that hate us and hate our Christianity, hate our, our Judeo-Christian values. They want us. We've already got rivers of blood in the inner city and a fentanyl disaster that's killing 100,000 young people a year. Now, I can't sit back and watch that. Help me. I cannot sit back and, and I'm, I'm getting hit by one side and the other. The one side is God is healing the sick. You watched cancer healed last night. You watched miracles last night. Here God is filling this tent wherever we go, whether we're in Los Angeles. Wherever we are, it gets full. How can I not ask for help? Listen, I know the stupidity of what people in the church are spending money on right now. How many of you know there's a lot of dumb things that people are spending money on? Now here's what they said in the Second World War. Put it up on the screen. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. That's how the war bonds were raised. They said, give us the tools and we will finish the job. They will defeat Nazism. They will defeat the enemy. I'm telling you it's not too late for America. I'm telling you that as great as these meetings have been, they are nothing compared to what God wants to do. And he's ready to do it. I want to read a verse to you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, father, mother, wife, or children or lands for my sake and the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold in this time. Many people have had to explain why they never got their hundredfold. Because when the evangelists gave that promise, it was what they were giving to that corrupted it. There are two things in that verse that signify the hundredfold. He said, you give it to Jesus and you give it to soul winning. He said, for my sake and the gospel. Let me say it again. My sake and the gospel. I know there are a lot of worthy causes and I'm not going to display myself as some supreme ministry. But I'm telling you that when you put money in this ground, it doesn't go to anywhere but soul winning. If you want to know where your money goes at MMM, you're looking at it right now. If you give it to me, I will finish the job. I'm telling you, I'm ready to beat up on the devil, but I need some help, investors. And I need people to believe. Now, for two years, we did not even put out a fundraising letter because God provided everything. I said, Lord, why am I going to ask now? He said, because you are now, in my timing, ready to explode the lie that's killing America. And it'll take money to do it. Now, I'm going to say one more thing. I want to put up a phrase. Uh, I don't know if I gave it to Cassandra. Children in the last days. 
There's one question that haunts you more than any other. What is life going to be like for my child and my grandchild after I'm gone? The America I knew, they're not going to get unless there's a miracle. And I quoted last night Hezekiah, 2 Kings 2019. I think we have that. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, there will be peace and truth at least in my days. And that sounds holy, but it couldn't be more wrong. Because what Hezekiah was told is that all the wealth of Israel was going to be kidnapped. And that his descendants would live in slavery. But his reaction was, at least when I'm alive, there'll be peace and truth. Here's what Thomas Paine said. I want that up there. If there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. I am not a joke. I'm not an entertainer. I'm telling you that I burn with a passion to bring the lost to Christ, to expose the woke agenda, and to destroy the works of the devil. Someone told me, someone warned me very high up that Trump might be watching tonight. So I'm going to look in this camera. And I'm going to say, Mr. President, you better listen. Mr. President, I remember the day that you were in the rotunda of the Capitol because Dr. Billy Graham's casket was laying there. And you put your hand on him and you said, God, give me more like this man. Because you understood America is not going to be saved by conservatism. It's not going to be saved by politics. It's not going to be saved by debate and rancor and fixing the corruption by human power. The only way to save America is to get Satan's claws off of the throat of this nation. Let revival come, Mr. President. Let revival come, Mr. President. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord is great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I'm going to look at you. You were singing rather emphatically, I speak Jesus for my family. So I'm going to ask for you to make out a gift. MMM, a war bond. Not an offering, a war bond. And what you're going to do is say, Mario, do what is in your heart. Tell me. The same thing the armor bearer said to Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14. Do whatever is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And I'm not going to go to the safe churches, the safe zones, the safe cities. I'm going to go in, and doctors are going to be astounded when tumors vanish and paralyzed limbs are loosened. And the worst gangster in town is baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. Now, Mario, just because you haven't taken an offering in a long time doesn't mean you have to do it all in one offering. How many of you ready to give? Raise your hand. Now, I'm going to be very blunt. I need everyone to give. And now I'm going to talk to you that are watching online. Last night, 20 thousand people saw the service online 
actually, by the time I got here, it was 21,000. So 21,000 people on the other side of this camera. And I'm going to put up a number for you to text a gift to establish the war chest for saving America. Not one dollar of this will go to anything else but that. It's all ammunition. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. Now, the gift is made out to MMM. MMM, I'd like as many as can to write a check. Last night, in spite of the fact that there was no offering, a very generous individual wrote a check for $10,000 toward the, toward a, it was no offering. We need a lot of people to do that. But see, no matter what you give, it will help, but be as generous as you can. Now I want to talk to you for a moment about the amount that you choose and then I'm done. It is a misnomer to pray the prayer that I'm going to say. It's a misnomer when someone prays, Lord, show me what I'm supposed to give. I really believe that you disappoint the Lord. Because Paul said, let each as they have determined in their own heart. Let me tell you something. I want to give the single young men some advice. If you see a young lady, you want to take her out, don't ask her where she wants to eat. <laughs> don't say, what would you like to do tonight? You got to be bold, sir. When I saw Michelle, whoo! Holy Ghost said, do you believe in love at first sight or should I make her walk past you again? I said, I don't need a second look. So when I asked her out, I said, here's where we're eating. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to have a good time. I've come up with it. When you look at your refrigerator, more than a Michelangelo or a uh, impression, French Impressionist Monet is the drawing of your grandchild yeah. right on that door. And they did it for you. And it says, love you, Grandpa. Woo! I messed up after that. But let me tell you something. The, the Lord responds the same way. Choose the amount. Finally, Christ is going to watch you. He's going to lean over your shoulder while you're writing that check. Because how do I know that? The Bible says that the widow... He said, she's given more than they all. He couldn't have known that unless he knew the amounts. And he could have said, she gave a lot. But this cheapskate over here is giving God a tip. Be generous. Save the country. Check is made out to MMM. If you are going to give cash in this great offering, I'd like you to let us give you a white envelope so that we can give you a record. And I'm going to admit to you that we are studying leaving the 501c3 status. We're looking at that. How many of you would give to God if there wasn't a tax write-off on it? How many of you would free us from the government control? Because that's where we're headed. But in the meantime, we don't want the government to take anything from you. They shouldn't. So we're going to let you give us the opportunity to provide you with this envelope. This envelope will also allow you to use your credit card, and you can fill that out. Most haunting question is what will America be like after you're gone? And what will you leave for your children? So don't hold back, ladies and gentlemen. Give me the tools. I will finish the job. If you uh, can text to give, can we put that up? And I want to make, all right. Text MMM to 77977. 
those of you watching especially, we really need the across the nation a display of the power of God. You know, uh, one thing that I didn't say, I'm going to say it now. Did you know that MMM is completely out of debt? We are completely out of debt. We don't owe money on any of this equipment. It was all paid for in cash. This tent was paid for in cash. And maybe many of you remember that our, our other crusade tent was a gift from Kenneth Copeland. And uh, he gave it to us. He gave us $200,000 for that tent. Now, we don't owe a dime on cars, on real estate, on furniture, not even at the end of a month is there a balance left on the credit cards. And the reason for that is we want everything you give to go right into souls. And that's where it's going to go. How many of you still love me even though I ranted and raved about money like that? Do you? Wow. We better think about relocating here. This is a wonderful audience tonight. In a moment, I'm going to preach the gospel. And I'm going to ask you at the end of this offering to close your eyes. And I want to warn you what's going to happen when you close your eyes. God is going to begin to deal with you. You know why I ask people to close their eyes? Because it instantly separates them from everybody around them. They are alone in the presence of God. Under this tent, and you need to know this tent is saturated with intercessory prayer. Because this ministry believes in intercessory prayer profoundly. We believe that there is a very clear uh, connection. That the war for men and women's soul is not one in the pulpit. It's one in the prayer closet. When we come out here, the defeat of the enemy is already gone. In Numbers 14, it was Caleb who said their protection has departed from them. Speaking of the enemies of God. In the similar way, we believe that when you come in this tent, your resistance to God, your inability to serve and love God, the protection against God's love goes away. And when you close your eyes, the process is going to begin. The process of God setting you free for the life you were born to live. The life you have now hurts, and it hurts for a reason. A man and a woman were never designed in marriage to raise a child without God's help. God has to be in the center of training up a child. God has to be in the center of holding a marriage together. And I want you to understand that, that in a few minutes, some of the most deepest questions you've ever asked are gonna be answered. Some of the most profound agonies that you're going through are going to be directly hit by the love and the power of God. And you're gonna thank God, and you're gonna remember this night for a long, long time that on that date of October the 24th in 2023 was the before and after. This is when I was lost. Then I was found. This is when I was addicted. And now I'm free. Yeah. This is when I was bound for hell. But now I'm a child of God. You're going to need a victory party after tonight. And you're going to extend your life into an open-ended victory party. It's going to start in a few minutes. Let's bow our heads and thank God. Say, we, we ask God to bless the giver, yes. But I thank you, Lord, that victory is going to be in these buckets. That provision from those that are watching right now online, that they know I've not asked in a long, long time. Now we can't stop. Now we must do it. Bless everyone who gives to this mighty project to save our nation. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. I'm not going to sing. Uh, 
I once begged a pastor, can I sing? And he said, yeah, sing on a hill far away. <laughs> but what I will do is tell you this. How many of you can give and listen at the same time? How many of you can give and listen at the same time? Tomorrow morning, I'm preaching a very dangerous sermon. And it's about preparing yourself for what's about to happen in this nation. I can't preach it at night. It's kind of controversial. But tomorrow morning, Catherine is going to lead worship. And I'm going to speak in this tent at 10 a.m. So at 10 o'clock, we're going to begin. Then I want to ask if Todd Coconado would stand up right now. Everybody clap for them. You know who he is. Todd is my co-host, and I'm his co-host, on Firepower every week. And tomorrow night, live in this tent, we're going to broadcast firepower right from here. So I'm going to have quite a day. I'm going to speak at 10 a.m. At 5.30 tomorrow, we're going to be in here live. So come early and be a part of a live audience that we're going to do the show. Then immediately following the show, we're going directly into worship with Catherine. It's going to be quite a day tomorrow. Now, I'd like everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. There is one thing about Jesus that is constantly overlooked. And yet, it is one of the most important things about Jesus that you need to know. In a moment, I'm going to tell you what it is. But you need to understand that you're about to discover why you hurt so bad. Why sickness may be ravaging your body. Why your family is experiencing massive turmoil, division, and stress. Why day after day it takes all of the strength that you have to get through the day. I'm about to explain it to you. Something is draining you, and it's not what you think. Some will say, well, it is stress, or I'm devoid of a certain vitamin, or my life is too demanding, or we're overscheduled. But we're going to get to that. Have we completed the offering? Are we still receiving? Okay, thank you. I think you were waiting for me to pray over it. Thank you very much. So the power of the Lord is present to do a miracle, to change the direction of your life once and for all, to make it as evident and clear as possible what is the right thing to do? You see, the word conviction means that you are overcome by a profound need to do something. It's not just right, it is so right, so completely right, that in the face of it, you feel that it's irresistible. One of the most powerful emotions that the human spirit will ever, ever experience is the overwhelming need to confess your sins. The need to confess your sin can become so powerful that it can lead to many maladies and many human uh, symptoms that you would never connect with that. The need to confess. So all of a sudden, as I am preaching, God is going to come over you and make it very clear what you're supposed to do. It'll be undeniable. It'll be completely irresistible. 
by the power of God. And it begins with a question that I will ask while you look me in the eye. Why did Jesus come to earth? What makes Jesus, part B of that question, different than Muhammad, Buddha, or any of the religious icons of history? I found that out personally, and it was a dramatic discovery. I was in California, and there was an event that I was invited to where I had five minutes to defend the Christian gospel. And all the major religions of the world, it was called the Holy Man Jam. Only Californians would come up with a name like that. And there was a lot of money and promotion. And so every cult, every discipline, every religion was represented there. Mysticism. And I was sandwiched between Scientology and Transcendental Meditation. And I had five minutes to speak between these two boys. Tucker Carlson recently said this. We are not confronting the issues that matter. They're being hidden from us. The things that really affect our lives are not being confirmed. That was lived on that day because they were talking about money. They were talking about your love life. They were talking about athletic prowess, intelligence. And the promise of their mystical religions was that your mind would be better you, you're as a person. But it didn't deal with reality. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come? And what made him different? That I needed to know. And I only had a few minutes to figure it out. I had literally obeyed a verse in the Bible that said, don't prepare anything beforehand. <laughs> I was a blank sheet of paper. And all of a sudden, right before I was to go on, God reminded me that there was a serial killer loose in that community. It was a very wealthy community, but none of the women went out at night because many of them had been strangled. That's how he got his name, the Hillside Strangler. And I mentioned that to them. And I said to them, isn't it interesting that right now you're talking about all these things when what's on the mind of people that are in this room is what do we do about a serial killer that's on the loose? My car, my joy, my money, doesn't matter if my wife is killed. If crime invades my life, what does that matter? Doesn't, doesn't matter. And I said, here is what I want you to understand. I'm going to ask Transcendental Meditation a question. I'm going to ask Scientology a question. I'm going to ask them all a question. One question. Do you have power over Satan? Because if you don't, nothing else matters. There's no such thing as safety as long as you and the devil have this agreement that he can attack you at any time. Why did Jesus come? 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil. You cannot sin without the devil's help. You say, I'm not possessed. I'm not saying you're possessed. I'm saying the devil is helping you. You couldn't commit adultery without his help. You couldn't get hooked on drugs without his help. You couldn't be angry and jealous and prideful and manically depressed without his help. The Bible says he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You can be an articulate Buddhist, 
You can be an articulate Scientologist, but you cannot destroy the works of the devil. And the works of the devil are the most important issue of this hour because the number one condition in America is oppression that is coming from the evil one. Now, let me go on. Let's go to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How many of you are getting something out of what I'm preaching so far? <laughs> Acts 10, 38, up on the screen. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Let's say you're multiple personalities. What if it's not chemical? What if it's oppression from the devil? What if your habits, your wife beating, your depression, your confusion, your obsessions are being fueled by something that medicine cannot handle? There's not a therapist. Say, and listen, why would you pay a therapist $300 an hour if he might be crazier than you are. <laughs> the uniqueness of Christ is that he defeated Satan. And there is a root of what's wrong with you based on your lack of power over the devil. Every Christian has to learn how to rebuke the devil. This is what Jesus said. This is what Muhammad cannot say. This is what Buddha cannot say. This is what Oprah cannot say. <laughs> Luke 10, verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I'm gonna try this. He saw it because he did it. I'm gonna try this side over here. He saw it because he did it. How many of you ever seen lightning? So you know he didn't float down, do you? At this time of year, Hollywood produces its sludge, its sewage about the demonic. And always, you picture this picture of a priest fighting a demon. And it's supposedly quite a battle. The bed shakes, the pea soup comes out, the head spins. And sometimes priests get thrown out of windows. It is up to the devil to create the false notion that he's in a fair fight with God. But I'm going to say something. Lucifer has a, as much chance against God as an amoeba on the surface of the sun. You know, and I want to tell you this. I have a verse out of order. I want to, we'll come back to Revelations 20 in a moment. But I want to go ahead to Matthew chapter 8. And when he had come to the other side of the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way and suddenly look me in the eye I, I stopped for a reason suddenly this these two that everyone in that county feared they were the baddest of the bad they were morbid they were evil they had the power to break chains no one could restrain them no one could get near them they would kill you without even flinching. But yet, when Jesus stepped out of the boat a few miles away, the vibration of the Son of God went all the way up to that cave. They didn't bother to hide. Am I preaching yet? They didn't bother to re retreat. They didn't bother to, they ran and fell at the feet of the Son of God because they were defeated and they were that defeated. Hollywood is wrong. The devil is not a match for God. And we need to quit these multiple deliverance 
fantasies that we conduct in church. That we got to yell for an hour. That we got to gather around them and scream at them. When you have the anointing of Jesus Christ, you can whisper at a devil. I'm going to try it again. You can whisper at a devil and it will come out in the name of Jesus. If you take it beyond that, you're just putting on a show. Suddenly, verse 29, they cried out saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? And we go back. What is the real deal between the devil and God? Go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. It says, I saw an angel. Look me in the eye. You know angels have names. We have Michael. We have Gabriel. This was a nameless angel. This is a but private angel. This is an angel that the book of Revelation said they hadn't earned a name yet. Look what it said about this angel, this but private. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. No, I'm going to say it. The lowest ranking angel in heaven, Satan, has the power to put you in a headlock, put chains on you, and bind you in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. Somebody shout. I saw an angel. And he had that power. But I want to go back. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, I want to read it again. It said, when he had come to the other side, the county of the Gadarenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no one could pass that way. Look me in the eye because you, you need to hear this. That root word for fierce is only used twice in the entire Bible. And it's in the New Testament. And it's right there in Matthew chapter 8. And then it is reused by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, fierce times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal. You see, when Hamas beheaded infants, they were under the influence of demons. The crime wave in America is being fueled by demons. Demons possess college professors' minds to say things that are patently stupid. And they know it. When it says fierce times, the self-love of this generation is coming from Satan. The Bible says he that sins is of the devil because the devil was the original sinner. He's saying here's the pipeline. It's coming from Satan into you because you don't have the protection of a living relationship with Jesus. I'll tell you how bad it gets. You realize that if you don't know Jesus, he's not even praying for you. And you say, well, that, that's a nasty thing to say. It's in the owner's manual. In John 17, he said, I do not pray for those that are in the world, but for those that you have given me. See, do you know who's trying to save you right now? As much as the Holy Spirit 
as much as Christ. It is God the Father who is the true evangelist of heaven. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's the one that gave the gift. He's the one that's speaking. When I decided to retire, which was a joke, <laughs> God said, I'm sending you out across America again. And because in my youth, I led a great student movement at the University of California, Berkeley. I saw thousands of young people saved in the, in the Jesus movement. Everybody you saw in the Jesus Revolution was a personal friend of mine. I used to eat with Lonnie Frisbee. Chuck Smith was always very kind to me. And we were all obsessed with winning the lost. But I'm going to tell you something. I told God, I'm not a young person anymore. The young used to listen to me. He said, no, you don't understand. I'm sending you out with a powerful powerful attraction the spirit of a father somebody help me right now we're living in those days that knot in your stomach is because you don't have power over Satan that constant waking of dread depression and loneliness is because you don't have power over Satan. And we've created an entire generation of believers that are falsely secure. Because you really aren't converted by going to church. You say, I go to church, I'm a Christian. If you walk into a donut shop, you don't become a policeman. And my wife and I pray for law enforcement. We respect them. But it's true. And, and I love the, the humor in that, but the root of that humor is a fact. It doesn't give you power over the devil. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right now, you're yoked. In order for God to save you, he has to break a yoke and then put a new one on you. The, one, the yoke you're under now is rejection in relationships. It's self-explosion of dreams. It's the vicious cycle of not knowing even your gender or your mind or your preferences. This is the world we're living in. The world is unnatural. You have zero protection of the progress of the unnatural in your own heart unless Christ is in you. Hey. I'm done. And I'm going to look at you. And I'm going to ask you this question. And I want you to think about it. Why would you say no to God? Why? I know the reasons you should raise your hand. If I ask you to raise your hand and let me pray with you to become a new person, why wouldn't you do that? And you'll say all kind of things. But you know what's interesting? I can come up with a thousand reasons for you to raise your hand. But if we were to have coffee and look in the eye, talk to you about your life, you, you would not be able to come up with one decent reason to keep your hand down. If you're walking in the victory of God, if you're full of the fire of God, you are protected. But let's quit looking at all of this church terminology because the devil doesn't respect it. The devil would not be able to cross the line with you as he is doing now if you are where you needed to be with God. The devil would not be able to take you to the extremes that you are going to. The imbalance, the instability, 
the doubt and fear that jostles your life. You can't be safe around the lukewarm Christians because they're the worst thing you can be around. They are a false guide. They are something that Jesus described as a grave. He said you walk over it. You don't even know you're walking over a grave. Now I'm going to stand here for a moment. I'm going to say, what do you want me to do? I want you to admit that the devil is oppressing you. I want you to admit that you're under attack and that you need help and that you need deliverance. Oh, we're not going to spit anything up. We don't need to do that. I've got an agreement with the devil. I say leave, he leaves. He has that understanding. Mario, I want God to take the devil off my back. That's what I want. I want God to take Satan off of my back. That's what I want. Close your eyes. I'm going to tell you this. The devil wants to keep you with such force. He is so fixated on his property rights of you that he will do everything in his power to keep you from doing the right thing. He will tell you, keep your hand down. Don't listen to that man. But I'm going to be honest with you. You already know what to expect if you don't repent. You already know what to expect. More of the same and worse. The devil made a grave error by allowing you to be seated under this tent tonight. He made a mistake. It was a, a miscalculation. He might have been at Starbucks when he should have been watching you. But I'm going to tell you something. You're here now. And think of what it means that if you resist God now. And the devil realizes he came so close to losing you, but he didn't. And those watching on, by live stream need to hear the same thing. Now is the time to make it very clear that Satan could never have you again. Never again. Now I'm going to pray. Father, I pray that people will listen to the hurt, the loneliness, the unnaturalness of their life, the agony that they're going through because they don't have power to be set free and forgiven. Give them, God, a conviction. This is what I got to do. I got to get right with God. I've got to surrender to God. I've got to renounce the devil. And I've got to be full of Jesus so that Satan realizes that his oppression of my life is over and it's never going to come back. Mara, I want a new life. I want a new life. And I want you to pray for me that tonight I will have a new life. I want this oppression, heaviness of heart, pain to go away. Remember that the oppression of sin can extend into sickness. It can be a root of what's wrong with your body. I want you to be set free. I want you to know Jesus, and I want you to let me pray with you. We're going to take that promise that I mention every night. Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20. If any two of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it will be done. Mara, this is not how my life was supposed to feel. Let's agree that it will stop feeling that way and never feel that way again. Let's agree together that that habit will be broken and not come back. Let's agree that your heart will be changed. Mara, I want to be set free, washed clean, set free by the power of Jesus Christ. Pray for me, Mario, that the oppression of the enemy will come off of my life. Raise your hand right now if that's what you want. If you're afraid that you're the only one with a hand raised, you couldn't be more wrong. If you're outside this tent, I want you to raise your hand. I want those of you that are watching to get ready to pray with us 
and join in this miracle for your life. If your hand is still not up, and you know it should be, if every atom of your being says, my hand ought to be in the air right now, that's because the enemy is fighting you. And I rebuke you, Satan. You're not going to have one person. Not one person will be left out of this miracle. Not one. If you wanted to raise your hand and you didn't, do it now. Do it now. And now, everyone, with your hands in the air, stand up. Stand up right where you are. Stand up right where you are. Stand up right where you are. Oh, there's so much power. Now, I want all of you to find the nearest aisle and walk up here to the front. All of you come. Start out so that the people behind you will feel more courage to come. And the, the faster you come, the more you're going to help the people around you. Fill in the front. Here they come. What a mighty move of God we're seeing tonight. Come in the name of Jesus. Fill in the front. I think you better clap louder than that. This is an amazing moment. This is an amazing moment. And, and they've come up so quickly. Put your hand over your heart. Look at me. God is going to give you a miracle that is so fabulous that there aren't words for it. In the New Living Translation of the second chapter of Philippians, it says it is God who is at work in you to give you and then he says two things, the power and the desire to do his will. The power and the desire. Imagine that. You're going to have new appetites. The ones that have been destroying you, if you repent, will be replaced by new desires, new affections. It is a common thing under our tent that people come off of heroin, crack cocaine, and fentanyl. Listen to this part. Without withdrawals. Now, you ready? Say these words out loud. Make sure it's your faith that you're exercising when you say this. Mean it and believe it. Jesus, the devil is attacking me. You defeated him on the cross. That victory is mine if I surrender. And therefore, I surrender. I surrender all. Everything about me belongs to you now. And I'm being converted. That means I'm being transformed. What I was is not what I'm going to be. I'm going to change. New appetites. New direction. New power. I am so grateful that I did not die before you saved me. Thank you, God, that in the nick of time, I have been saved. I have been set free. I know that you died for me. I know that you rose from the dead. You are the Son of God. And by your blood, I'm being washed clean. All my sins are being washed away. And I belong to you now, and I always will. And when I die, 
I will be in heaven with you. In Jesus' name. Now hold your applause. You've got to save your energy. I would like you that are standing here to help me reenact the opening of the Red Sea. So get on one side or another right there. Let's open it up, one side or not. I still will. So it happened right here. Now, I'd like those of you standing here and here to know something. When you come back, you're going to see with your own eyes God heal the sick. He's going to heal people of medical conditions. If it's like last night, it's life-threatening diseases that will be healed by Christ, not me. That's right. But if there was a coffin on this stage and a dead body sat up and began to dance, it would not be as great a miracle as the one that God just gave you in your soul. But no, it wouldn't. Now, with something this momentous, we need five minutes of your time outside the tent, which is a nice night. It's almost too warm in here. And you're going to be out there five minutes. Angels are going to protect your seat. Then you're going to come back and join us for a culmination of this night in the supernatural. So turn, face that way. Turn and face that way and head down. And I've trained you, church. Welcome your new brothers and sisters. Welcome them into the family of God. If someone's a little bit slow, it's okay to go around them. To God be the glory. Hey, David, how you doing? Of course, David, I recognize you. How you doing, man? You look the same. I gotta get busy, though. I'll just shake you. How many of you are clapping here? How many of you are doing the right thing? Hallelujah. Now, you may be seated. Do you know my favorite part of the night? Uh, as much as I love it when they pray to get saved, that's, that's the best, no doubt about it. But what is also special to me is when they walk back in. Because a long time ago, and some of you need to understand this, I wondered why we put the altar call at the end of the meeting and then hoped that they would be in church next week. So I figured, why not get them saved in the middle? So then they come back and they're in their first church service as we're already doing follow-up. Now, if you think that's smart, would you clap right now if you think that's smart? And when a young convert sees a wheelchair empty, their eyes get big and their faith gets strong. I'm going to say this and see what you say. You know what is the greatest fear of the devil is when young people see the supernatural power of God. Because they're going to do something with it that nobody else is going to do. I told you the other day that I read a book called On writing well and it sold over a million copies and I forgive me for forgetting the author's name but if you went to writing school you had to read that book and I was surprised but I got to a part of it where he's talking about sentence construction and he said what are the most fantastically constructed books for sentence structure is the King James Bible and, you know, I admired 
his intelligence. Because it takes intelligence to realize that God's word is the best thing there is. Now, I don't, I don't agree with the guy that said, well, if the King James was good enough for Paul and Silas, it was good enough for me. Because there's something wrong there. There's something bad wrong there. I mean, but I want you to go to Mark chapter 2, and I'm going to read out of the King James Bible. One of the good things is that if we did popularize the King James Bible again, is that it is called public domain. You can actually get a Bible, print it, a King James Bible, and you won't owe royalties to anybody. It's a powerful, powerful uh, translation. I'm going to look at Mark chapter 2, verse 1. Say, I want to be healed. Say, I want to be healed. It says this. Again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Everybody say noise. noise. See, in the King James, the word noise is used as a verb, and I love it. Because they noised that he was in the house. The miracle of this is that the temple was readily available to Christ certain hours. But he chose to minister in a house. This is what I believe is when the devil fears is whenever the church gets outside of their four walls to operate. So you're not helping me enough. Now, listen. And it was on a weekday. It was not on the weekend, it was on a weekday. And it says, and straightway many were gathered together inasmuch as there was no room to receive them, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word to them. This is where you have to understand me. I don't always preach on healing. Sometimes I'll preach on holiness, repentance, second coming. I'll preach on the gifts of the Spirit. But I will never deliberately preach in order to get miracles. Now, here's what's important. Many of the people that gathered by the front door of this house didn't have a right motive. Some of them came because they're sick and they heard other people got healed. They still didn't know what he, what he thought or what he, his teaching was. They didn't care. All they knew is they were miracles. Curiosity seekers, we get them all the time. Then there are others that were there to criticize. Then there are others that were there because someone kidnapped them and dragged them. So listen carefully. You say, Mar, why are you taking this time? Because from all probability, tomorrow's my last day with you. And I'm trying to pour truth into you as much as I can. Why? Why are you trying to do that, Mario? Because I want this power to continue after I leave. Somebody said amen. Genesis 49.10 is an impulse about healing and about Jesus. Look me in the eye and understand it. I did fake out the people that run the Blessatron because they thought I was going to read a bunch of verses out of Mark. I, I'm jumping ahead. The Spirit of God said this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. The best way to read this is to say, the law will not depart until the one that is due the honor and is the owner of the honor comes, and unto him will the gathering of the people be. The greatest sin of the modern church can be described 
as something that I saw one day when myself, my one and a family member of mine, saw a young lady in a restaurant that we knew well. She was a Christian girl. She was dressed seductively. Her makeup was intense. Her look was that of the uniform of a certain line of work. And if you don't want to be accused of being one, don't wear the uniform. She had the uniform on. We were horrified and we tried to, what's wrong? She said, my boyfriend is no longer interested in me. He's interested in this type of woman. So I changed. She was beautiful, she was smart, she was godly, and she was given into a cultural thing. How is that any different than the church? Changing the gospel because someone lied to us that the real Jesus was not attractive to the modern society. You know how stupid that was? You know how stupid that was? In Genesis began the belief that Christ would attract a crowd. And it said in Mark chapter 2 that it was noised about and wherever he went a crowd formed. And it didn't matter the time of day. It didn't matter the place. He was so attractive and life-giving in his ministry that when he spoke people were afraid to eat for fear of missing something he might say. The disciples didn't notice it but he noticed it one day when he said these people have been following me and for three days now they haven't eaten. I know when a preacher is stuck in a negative life and ministry. They walk into our tent and they look around and they're baffled. Number one, why is everybody here? Number two, why did they come early? Why are they coming every night? Because Jesus is in the house. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Somebody help me. We, we, are, we are losing the nation for all the wrong reasons. The church has the edge. The church has the power to say, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. It takes a genius to make Christianity boring. And there are preachers who are so boring that if they were the first to describe kissing to junior high school kids, they would never do it. How many of you are with me so far? And I'm going to find it right here. And again, he returned to Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered, because Genesis said it would be that way. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Inasmuch as there was no room to receive them, that's what your church could be like. And we could destroy this myth that we need to seduce people with 12-minute express sermons and coffee and you ought to be skeptical of any church that offers you coffee before anything else. Because they're looking at you like, you better drink this if you want to make it through this. How many of you want a Christianity that doesn't have to have coffee? I'm going to say, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. He's enough to win the atheists. He's enough to turn the culture around. Let's quit doing human program and go back to a dependency on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
How many of you would like to hear something really controversial? I need, this is that rascal audience I know. You, let me tell you something. You know how Pentecost spread around the world? 600 million Pentecostals? They estimate that 50,000 people a day are baptized in the Holy Spirit in the world. Christianity never saw anything like that. No missionary movement ever came close. What came out of Azusa Street literally was the most explosive soul winning event in the history of the world. And it went around the world. Why did it? And we, de we developed this legend about being against makeup. And I had that moment where a lady came up with her husband and she said, what do you think about makeup? I said, honey, for your husband's sake, get some. are you if that's the only thing you remember about tonight? <laughs> Back to the anointing. <laughs> the most important revelation that the body of Christ needs to see the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, cancers removed, and the most notorious addicts delivered is to re, re get the revelation of what it means to have Christ present in your meeting. Amen. Everything I do, everything I focus on has to do with this. In the afternoon, I'm alone with God. You have to be there. The music's important, but you have to be there. The sermon's important, but you have to be there. The thing that separates Christianity from everything else. I told you early on, it had to do with defeating the devil, but it has to do with something else. I told you, we're the only movement in the history of the world where the founder attends every meeting. If the revelation, look, if the revelation of Jesus being under this tent right now if God were to open your eyes and make you realize that it isn't Mario that's important, it is Jesus who is here, standing in our midst. Somebody praise him like you know he's in the room. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for being here. I gotta read verse three, I'm taking too long. And they came, they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, who was born of four. Four men are carrying this paralyzed man. And I love this next verse because it's so perfect for now. It says they could not get nigh unto Jesus for the press. The Wall Street Journal. The Washington Post. The LA Times. The Boston Globe. It's it's amazing statement. Uh, out of context. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they tore the roof off the building. Where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Then Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, I wish you would understand who Jesus is. He's the author and the finisher of faith. It starts with him, it ends with him. Say amen. amen. Moving on. One of the missions of Christ is to detect the presence of faith and to honor it. 
He said, with all this being true, when the Son of Man returns to earth, shall he find faith on the earth? Which tells us he's looking for it. When someone was told by Jesus that he couldn't heal them in Matthew 15, the Syrophoenician woman, he said it to her, you, I can't heal you. He said, I'm sorry, but it's too late. While you were teaching, the bread fell off the table and these stiff-necked hypocrites didn't get it, but I got it. And he said, great is your faith, be it unto you as you have spoken. Watch it. And it says that Jesus looked at the man and said, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. If he's talking about the fact that four people brought him there, not because he was a sinner, but because he, he was paralyzed. You don't understand that the ability for God to get past your unbelief is tied to you repenting of sin. There's a key there. One of the most common barriers to healing is unforgiveness. More than in any other thing that I know of. If there's a root of unforgiveness. And I'm going to tell you something. A man walked into my meeting. Excuse me. He rolled into my meeting. He was rolled in. And he looked at me and he said, God's going to heal me tonight. But there was something in his countenance that made me suspicious. He said, he has to. He's got to do it. Unless he's a liar, he's going to do it. This man wasn't trusting God. He was demanding God. He was tempting God. He was acting as if he was entitled to a miracle. And he was going to literally hold God hostage. Listen to me. If we have the power to order him around, he is not God. And when I hear preachers talk like that, Listen to me, I just tell God what to do. You're a fool. You know, you might as well put on a three-piece suit made out of tin foil and go out in an electrical storm. How many of you believe that God is God and we're not? So when you approach God, when you approach God, it is in humility. You're not asking, you know, you say, well, I'm going to demand my rights. Try that at home. Walk in from work and look at your wife and say, I demand my rights. You're not only going to get rights, you're going to get lefts. Lefts and rights. Why can't I boastfully and arrogantly ask God to heal me? Because his son died on the cross and there is an undercurrent of intimation that God cannot be trusted to want to heal you so therefore we have to prime the pump by either confession or continually raising the notion you have to do this he does not have to do it and I'm going to tell you this you come in humbly you come in with mercy and you come in with knowledge that any God that bankrupted heaven put his own son on the cross is not on trial as to whether he loves you and wants to heal you. I need a loud amen on that one. You know who said it better than I did? Romans 8, 32. Where Paul said, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not, along with him also, freely give us all things? God is not on trial that he loves you. God is not on trial that he wants to heal you. The question mark is not the goodness of God. The question mark is your attitude and your spirit and your unbelief. You are on trial. God is not. I'm going to run around this tent right now. 
God is not on trial, you are. I was on a plane with a very famous preacher who doesn't like Pentecostals. He believes that all of this stopped, that we had a power outage uh, after the apostles died. And ironically, he feels like the devil is doing miracles today, but not the church. So he has God fighting with one hand tied behind his back. And he stood there and he said, I know you, I've seen you on TV and you're one of those guys that believes in healing. I am guilty as charged. So then he said, it doesn't happen anymore. And I said, why? He said, well, because we have the whole Bible. That made as much sense as a pregnant pole vaulter. Now you can't unsee that one. And I said to him, why is the completion of scripture the basis for the cessation of gifts? He said, because we don't need miracles anymore because people believe the Bible is the word of God. I said, so if doubting the existence of God and the Bible is the key to miracles, we are candidates for a hurricane of miracles. And I, I said, I'll, I'll prove to you that God heals today. I'll prove to you right now from the book of Mark chapter two, I'll prove it to you that he heals today. And immediately when Jesus perceived the spirit of the theologians, that they had reasoned within themselves. He said to them, why reason you these things in your heart? Whether it is easy to say to the sick of the palsy, your sins be forgiven you, or to say arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick, I say unto thee, arise, take up your bed and go your way to your house and immediately he rose up took up his bed and went forth before them all in as much as they were all amazed so I looked at my seatmate on the plane and I said does the world today need to know that Jesus forgives sin not asking you about your Baptist roots don't care about your background I want to know does anyone in the world need to know that Jesus forgives sin right now? Because that's why he heals the sick. So that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. Am I preaching yet? But I'm not done yet. How many of you give me five more minutes? I know I've been going a while. Just a few more minutes. Is anybody getting anything out of this? Are you hungry for the truth? Here it comes. It was surprising to me that the apostles didn't ask for miracles because they wanted the sick healed. They wanted the sick healed so that people would be saved. And you say, well, Mara, that's impossible. No. If you go, and I dare the people that run the Blessedron to find this one fast. But if they don't, I'm still going to love them. <laughs> Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and 30 says these words. Here's that pregnant pause. It says these words. Lord, behold their threat. And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may preach your word. Look at me, ladies and gentlemen. Every minister in this room can turn their ministry around automatically by le learning this truth right here. Your youth group will turn around. Your church will turn around. You, you'll be able to sell all those church growth manuals and syllabuses. Nice glowing fire in the fall. If you learn one thing, God has a message. God has a message. 
The difference between us and the first century apostles is they knew their message and we don't know ours. The reason that we don't have power is we don't know what God is trying to say to America. We don't know what he's trying to say. We have a theory. We have a theology. We have many Bible schools where you were taught by people that if they had a gift, they wouldn't be there trying to train you. God has a message. You say, Mar, that's a hard word. Listen, when a nation is about to die, you start to get real with the church. You start to get down to the root of it and say, here's the deal. There's a message. There's a message. Paul knew he had a message. Every single person that you look at in the Bible, from Elijah, you, David, every hero of the word of God was aware of one thing above another. God had given them a message. And it was for the world. And when Paul said, I was not disobedient to the, holy, the heavenly vision, he was talking about the message God gave him. You got to find your message. You got to find your message. And you got to start preaching it. But Mara, what if it's controversial? That's what's wrong with you. You're settling for false success. There are crumbs. There's, there's pitiful little amount of success you're having. And you're holding on to it like a life preserver. When you need to let it go. Because it's not worth saving anyway. Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? And get a hold. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may preach your word. While you stretch out your hand to heal. They didn't say heal. They said give us boldness to preach the word. While you stretch out your hand to heal. The only reason I want miracles is so that the message will get out. I finished my flight. The man wouldn't talk to me anymore. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Put your hand over your heart. I told you that one of my heroes of faith was Miss Kuhlman. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, you would do well to find out. Because she restored a dignity to the healing ministry that was desperately needed. The same with Oral Roberts, who finished strong and obeyed God to his last breath. I want you to be healed right now. And the greatest test of all is if we'll overcome our fear of how late the hour is. Because it's not God's fault that we strayed from truth. It's not God's fault that we were distracted by programs and that a night like this was needed to rechart our course back to truth. Don't blame God for the lateness of the hour. Blame the Laodicean church. Now, some of you are listening to prophets that give you a daily horoscope. You're drifting from the word of God and you're being deceived. Now you want God to heal your body. How is that any different than the husband that ignores his wife all day and then wants her to be romantic? We're going to woo the spirit to come and touch us after blatantly ignoring the issues that matter to the Holy Spirit. So now comes the power. Pray in the language of the Holy Spirit right now. Pray in the language of the Holy Spirit out loud right now. There are people that feel heat in their spine. There are people that are in this meeting that feel the heat of God going through their body. And right now, the most important thing that I can do 
is to obey God in your miracle, in your healing, in the touch of the Spirit of God that is on you right now. Look at me, please. This section right here, I want you to obey the Lord right now. There's healing power flowing down there. The first miracle is this gentleman right here on the third row on the aisle. You have glasses, you have your hand over your heart. This is God's power touching you right now. And I want you, to, I want you all to listen to me as I speak this word. I want everyone in that section right now, there is healing that is flowing through your body for your spine and your legs and your feet. And they're, they're in this section. All of you that are fighting a condition in your spine, your legs and your feet, do not hesitate one second. Stand up right now, wherever you are. You're going to see something amazing. I want everyone to take notice of something. You see the gentleman right there? He's standing because it's his spine that God revealed to me. But that man is one of many that are being healed right now. Now I want people to listen to me. Five minutes from now, vertebrae are gonna go back into place. I'm gonna tell you right now, look over here. Lady, it looks like either or a, a light salmon, almost pink, right there. You just look that way. Yes, dear. You know what you're being healed of right now? Put your hand right on your spine. It's sciatic nerve. You've had it several times where the, the nerve pinches at the base of your back and radiates down to your leg. On occasion, and it's rare, that people will get it running down both legs. You've had that. You've had pain in both legs and you've been bedridden with sciatica. Now I'm gonna tell you, you've just been healed, but that's not all. Everyone hold steady. You're healed of something else and you're never gonna be the same. I can see your medicine cabinet right now. I can see it you are being prescribed several different medications. Blood pressure, pain, inflammation. It's all true, isn't it? I see that. So what's happening is your back is being healed, sciatic nerve, but your eyes, behind your eyes, you're being healed right now. Your neck is being healed right now. Your heart is being healed. Five years ago, they found that you had a heart that was in trouble. That was five years ago. This 2023, we're talking 2018, they examined you. You went in to a routine checkup for something else, and they said, we want to see you again because of something in your heart. Is that true? Wave your hand at the people. They need to know. I want all of you to give God the glory. I don't know how you can stay so calm. Does anybody realize what just happened? Now, sir, my dear, would you walk out to the aisle? And dear in the light blue, would you go with her? Because you're going to be healed while you're walking with her. now oh this is real okay all of you that are near someone that's standing understand the anointing is so strong that all these people are going to be healed in their spines and their legs and I'm already aware of several other things that I've got to be careful listen this is where young preachers need to grow up listen to the war horse here for a second don't speak it just because you hear it Wait on the Lord. Let it grow and clarify. It doesn't matter. You're not under pressure to perform. Amen. I come into a tent. I don't care if anyone is healed. 
because my concern is to obey God. And if I obey God, He's going to heal. My eyes are on Him. All right, here's what I need to do. Stephen, if you'll come back toward Larry for a moment. Thank you, sir. My friend, right there, please step to the aisle. You, you sir, yes. This is an, is someone with you tonight? Dear, yes, would you stand up for a moment, dear? One time I did this. I'm gonna say this very quickly. I was in Phoenix. I called out someone. I said, you have diabetes. And instead of responding to me, he had a pad of paper in his hand. He was standing there, I don't know why. I said, you have diabetes. He ran out of the building. He left. That really encouraged me. <laughs> he promptly ran home and took his normal dose of insulin and promptly fainted. Taken to emergency, his doctor met him there and he examined him and he said, you overdosed on insulin. And. Uh, he said, I don't know how that's possible, Doc. I just did my normal. He said, you're going to have to rehearse for me your night. I was in a church. I was there to expose a false minister. I'm an elder in the First Baptist Church of Phoenix. And I'm doing a Bible study Sunday morning against the gifts of the Spirit for today. And while I'm standing there and I'm writing these things against him, he said, I had diabetes. And the doctor said, you dummy. <laughs> and God is healing you. So, it was an amazing Sunday school class the next morning. <laughs> I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I really am. Sir, God is going to use you. Your days of ministry and being used of God are not waning. They are just starting. You understand what I'm saying? And so, the back, the legs are only a part of it. God is giving you a miracle in your body and giving her a miracle in her body because you are about to be resurrected with a tongue of fire. It's happening right now. You're getting a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Somebody better give God the glory. We're in a meeting. It's on now. I'd like you to place your hand on your wife's shoulder blades right below her neck where she's being healed. And in her legs, your abdomen, eyes, and your chest. All of it is resurrection power. Let me tell you, you haven't found your audience yet, sir. The audience you've been trying to influence is not your audience. They're too stuck in their ways. God's going to give you a young audience. And it's going to be power. I, don't, I didn't even know he was in the ministry until God told me he was. So we give God the glory. Is anybody giving God the glory? Now, here it comes. I just got permission to come off the stage. You are totally healed. This procedure you're scheduled to have, go back, have them re-examine you, you're not gonna need it. You are set free, you're healed. And you, sir, are gonna have influence. God is healing you. I want you to put that hand right there. Your chest, your heart, your back, your legs, 
and the entire side of your body has been healed in Jesus' name. Now I'm coming over here. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, give them a great big hand. This is a miracle. Both of you. All of you. Put your hand in the air. All of you that are on your feet, put your hand in the air. Spines are straightening. Healing is coming in the name of Jesus. Don't be surprised if I don't start praying for some of you myself and laying hands on you. But right now, you need to know that Jesus is touching you. Now, I'm going to tell you that, and I'm going to prophesy, there's going to come a report of this event. It's going to go out. Because many people that don't know they are healed are going to find out they're healed. And there's going to be multiple reports of miracles. Now, I've got to, I've got to finish this. You're an evangelist now. Yes, you are. Get that look. Ooh, that fire-breathing, soul-winning. I've got to lay hands on somebody. And then take this hand, put it on her back. I told you about the doctor's appointment five years ago where they found out about your heart. I told you about uh, the base of your spine where the sciatic nerve has been pinched on occasion and made you bedridden. What's happening is that God is also healing your blood. Your blood is being transformed. And see, what happened is your immune system was attacked, minimized, making you subject to various viruses, colds, respiratory things. And that's gone now. It's gone. Now, yeah. And you are healed in Jesus' name. Now, you are also healed. You are also healed. And I'm going to tell you, you need to put this hand, thank you, keep that hand up. Your hands are being healed. Wrists, forearms, back, legs, it's a wonderful moment. I'm going to ask you to return to your seats for a moment. Everyone here, look at me right now. You feel the power of God? You, my dear, have been chosen the Lord for a special work. You had a traumatic accident, damaged your body. Now all the effects of it are being healed. I want you to understand, this miracle is starting in both your feet, where you've had radiating pain in the arches and in the toes. One of your knees has been almost destroyed. Your ribs, the rib cage, is being healed by the power of God. Where if you take a deep breath, you can have tremendous pain. And that is God. You wake up three to four times a night when you're sleeping. And it's because of various pains that shoot through your body and affect your breathing. How can I know all this? I can't know this. You're healed in the name of Jesus. Now, listen up. Glory to God. Somebody said, glory to God. I want you to help me by putting your hand on this man's back. Sir, God is going to give you boldness. Boldness. Boldness like a lion. He's going to turn you into a lion. The Lord said that to me. He's healing your body. He's taking away your sickness once and for all. You've had a chronic illness that comes and it goes. It's not coming back. And you're going to be a lion for Jesus. I'm moving on. I'm coming back here. El Señor me dijo que un milagro está en esta casa de Dios para alguien que puede hablar español.
Quiero ver su mano. Ponele a pie, por favor. I'm going to tell you a story. You know this lady? Stand up, sir. This miracle is so amazing that you're going to have joy unspeakable and full of glory. But I want you to, you were willing to go. You were willing to travel. And you traveled. When you traveled, you contracted an illness, came home with it, and you've been fighting it ever since. Now, you're being healed in the name of Jesus. I want to tell you. I want you to look, be my witness. Your head is being healed right there. Your dizziness is being removed in Jesus' name. Your abdomen is being healed. Put your hand on your stomach. Everything I'm saying is absolutely true. And you see, what the devil did to lie to you is that you were willing to serve. You were willing to help people that no one was able to help them like you. And you went and you did it. And the devil has tried to say it was a mistake. But it, God said, I never forgot your good works. I never forgot your sacrifice. So your breathing, your heart, your back, your eyes, and your legs are healed in the name of Jesus. Somebody better give God the glory. You better give God the glory. There's so many people being touched here that it's almost scary. And I'm going to tell you something. I hope you're skeptical. Because, man, I'm going to tell you, this is going to hit you like a Mack truck if you're not careful. <laughs> I always wondered why they said a Mack truck. You know, a pickup truck would do just fine, right? <laughs> but I'm telling you, God is here. And there's some that lead a church that you're here. Your church went through a split. And your denomination sided with the other group. Because they love to do that stuff. And it hurt you. It was devastating. But I'm going to tell you what. It's a new day if you'll let it be. It's a new day. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start being bold right here in Jesus' name. Sir, would you stand up for a moment? Because you're about to be filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit all over again. Now listen. You've got a gift. Just because people didn't understand it doesn't mean it wasn't real. I'm telling you, brother, you got a gift. And there are sermons. And there are messages. And there's revelation. Going to come out of you. What am I doing picking all these preachers out of the audience? What is going on here? Stand up, dear. You know this man? <laughs> you know, there will be once or twice where... I've done that, and they say, I don't know him. <laughs> but you do know him, right? You know, this man is about to receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God is going to heal his heart and his pancreas and his feet. He has neuropathy of the feet. He has heart disease. He has diabetes. And the devil tried to kill him. He had two occasions where he was attacked and... Is anybody starting? I'm up here feeling real weird right now. I need people to be, come on, feel weird along with me. Don't let me be, be weird alone. Diabetes, heart disease, lung, lung problems. And your feet, you're healed. Now, both of you put your hands in the air. Separate for a moment. It's the only time you'll be allowed to separate. Put your hand in the air. And brother, there's a new tongue. A new tongue of the Holy Spirit coming on you. 
out loud, out loud. There it is. There it is. This man is getting a tongue. I'm, I'm going to bother you. I'm coming in here. This man's receiving a, he's speaking in tongue. Is there revival yet? Is there revival in this place? Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bother you. And so the entire crowd began to pray in tongues right there. Start praying in the spirit. I'm, I'm stuck back here. I'm stuck back here. Sir, would you help me? Yes, sir. See that young man standing there in the black coat? My brother, look at me. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe that in this era today, God is raising up new voices for his glory? Do you believe that? Because you're one of them. Now, sir, walk and just gently put your hand on his back. That man who's putting his hand on your back is actually a man of God. You are a man of God. And you have true humility, sir. And God has used you to do amazing things. And you have an incredible history. The Lord told me that. And you're imparting something to a young man who's going to be winning souls and healing the sick. And the fire of God is coming on you, sir. Start praying in that heavenly language right now. Come on, out loud. He called Rekabara said. Can somebody please clap and give God the glory? There was somebody sitting over here, a lady, and where did she go? I need an usher over here because I might fall down. <laughs> the beautiful thing about your spirit is that when you've been tested, you didn't complain. People didn't know the secret war that you were fighting. Nobody knew. I do need an usher to come stand with her. And we might need one for you too because this is coming down as a shock wave. To tell you that you're being healed is, is a very inadequate understatement. You're, you're being revolutionized. You know, what God is doing for you is going to your, your cells. The cells of your body is where this miracle needs to start. This disease that's being healed begins in the bone marrow and it's gonna be transformed. Now your burden to be used of God, your burden to finance a ministry is being honored right now. Now, I want you to put your hand on your stomach. It starts right there. That's where it all begins. This fire is burning this out of your body. This thing that's been growing is dying right before my eyes. The next x-ray will show that you are in remission and they're not even gonna be able to call it remission. They're gonna say, it's omission because it is gone.
Raise your hand. You're being filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit right now. Start speaking in tongues. Receive the gift. This is happening all over the place right now. Somebody start praying in the spirit. Let's have, a, let's have an Azusa Street moment right here. My God, we give you the glory. If you are near someone that is in a wheelchair, I want you to receive the honor of going to pray for someone in a wheelchair. Do it right now. If you're near one, get to them. I bind cancer in the name of Jesus right here. I bind cancer in the name of Jesus right here. Receive that miracle in Jesus' name. There are two malignant tumors in this section. Both of them are being healed. Two people with cancer are being healed in this section. Over here is another person being healed of cancer. Right over there. Right over there. Why would I be able to point at you and you know who you are and, and just obey the Holy Spirit? Everyone battling diabetes stand up right now you're going to see a vast number of people get up don't be ashamed don't be embarrassed and my sister right down here you were healed of this you're trying to get a double dose aren't you <laughs> you're trying to double dip tonight but now that you're up you're in the ministry lay your hands on that man right next to you Hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody said hallelujah. hallelujah. If you're battling diabetes, get up on your feet. Somebody stand next to these people. If you're near them, get up, lay your hand on them. You're going to be responsible for a healing. You better remember their face. Maybe even get in, get in some kind of a connection to them. Because you're going to hear a story. Somebody said hallelujah. 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 Pray out loud in the Holy Spirit. Pray. Pray out loud in the Holy Spirit. To God be the glory. Let's do this together while you're praying in the Spirit. Lord, I ask you to bind the diabetic conditions that are in this building, restore the proper condition of their pancreas and their body, reverse the damage that's been done to their eyes, their heart, their feet, and their joints. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. We need people laying hands on those that are in wheelchairs. In the name of Jesus, restore. Restore them. Let them walk in the name of Jesus. Let them be healed by the power of Christ. We pray. We believe. We thank you. You know, these miracles have already happened. So everybody begin to clap your hands and shout to God. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. Give him the glory. What a night. Everybody, please stand, if you will. I like that. I like that. In the name of Jesus. 
we're getting, people are getting on fire. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you, Jesus. I feel some attitude forming in this place. I feel like there's Americans in this house that are saying, God is with me. We're going to get our country back. Oh, wouldn't you love, how many of you want to be a part of a nationwide revival in America? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The reason I want you to remain standing is that in a moment I'm going to ask Brother Frank to come to the stage and close in prayer. And last night I started praying when I wanted him to pray. I have matured since then. Everybody said 10 a.m. I'm going to talk to you and I want you to understand the purpose of the meeting tomorrow morning. And I want to thank Catherine Mullins for being willing, her and her team, to lead worship tomorrow morning. Now, you know what's going on in Israel, but you don't know everything. You know what Hamas has done, you don't know everything. I don't preach for sensationalism. I preach what Jesus said. How is it that you're able to discern the coming weather but you do not see the signs of the time. Your business, your family, your emotions, and your future are tied to obeying God's word that is being revealed in this hour. Now, if you have not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you need to take off work, be here at 10 a.m., because we're going to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a powerful morning. Then at 5.30 tomorrow, on this stage, Todd Coconato and myself are going to go live with firepower. We have thousands of people that are watching it. And you need to be a part of our audience. And besides that, if you come early, you're going to be assured of a seat. Because tomorrow night, this place is going to be packed. So come early. Come early. And finally, there's a rumor that some people still have money. <laughs> and what better way to help you than to tell you to buy one of my books. Now, the book that came out, It's Our Turn Now, predicted what you're seeing under this tent. It's a handbook for turning this nation around. It's no fluff, it's real. Normally it's $15, but Wait, there's more. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> we have copies of Vessels of Fire and Glory, which became a bestseller. And then Do Not Leave Quietly, which is currently one of the hottest books that we have. People are buying it everywhere. So. They're all normally $15, but if you buy all three, you can get all three for 30. If you buy any two, you'll get them for 20. If you buy one, it's $50. <laughs> you'll get it at a regular price, and you'll see that in the bag. Everybody get one, and they are autographed. I did sign them because I just wanted to use a gimmick. Close your eyes right now. Bring the lost and the sick to the house of God tomorrow. This is a house of God. This is as sacred and holy ground as it gets. And be a part of it. Keep your heads bowed as Frank comes to close in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the souls that gave their life tonight, Lord. We thank you, my God, for their lives will never, ever be the same tonight, Lord God. Father, we thank you for the miracles that people got healed tonight, my God. We seal it, my God, with your Holy Spirit, God. 
And Father, I pray that tonight, God, that the fire of revival and glory would be upon each and every one that would have the burden in the hearts, my God, to reach others, my God, for your kingdom and for your honor and for your glory, my God. So, Father, as we go out tonight, my God, may we be filled with excitement, expectation, God. Call their loved ones, their friends, their family, my God, to bring them, my God, because, Lord, they're living in the greatest time of history, Lord. And for this, Lord, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. As you're walking out, there's a table that has a bunch of flyers. If you're going out to eat, you're stopping to get, grab some flyers. We'll be here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And then following the last couple of days, we've been on the streets from 12 o'clock to 1.30. Come join us tomorrow as we get on the streets. And uh, everything that you have, remember there's revelation, activation, demonstration. Take everything that you've got from this place and give it away tomorrow. Thank you so much. God bless.